Hey guys, welcome to the book review for The Cult of Soul Invictus by G.H. Hagelsberg. So, if you watch my videos, you know how I like to do my book reviews. I like to get into the claims of the author. And with this book, claims of the author is going towards paganism, the early worship of the sun, sun worship during the first century going into the second century AD, of course. So yeah, these are the uh, agenda that I'm gonna be going over. The Sun Cult up to the first century, the establishment of the Cult of Sol Invictus Egobel, which I believe you guys are really going to like, the continuation of the Cult of Sol Invictus in the reign of Arlean. So yeah, like I said, um, I do my research, guys. I have my sources, which you'll see. I will provide also. But at the same time, also, please, can't stress this enough. And you'll see this is going to be a repeating <laughs> quote for me. Do your research. Please, don't just regurgitate what you hear. Hear what someone's saying. Look it up and just solidify to make sure that it's correct. So, yeah. Other than that, I hope you guys enjoy the video. And yeah, now let's get into it. Enjoy. As we know, around the f first century CE, everybody was still in their pagan roots. Because as we all know, Christianity didn't take a stronghold until Constantine in the third century CE. So, this time, paganism was flourishing when it comes to certain rites and cults to the Greeks, the Romans, and even to the Egyptians. So, to some well-known sun deities, we'll start off with the Egyptians when it comes to Ra or Re, in some ways you can pronounce it, Atum Re or Atum Ra with the Egyptians. And coincidentally, where we get Sun Ray from is actually from that word from that Egyptian deity, Sun Ray. Look it up. Interesting. And as we go to the Greeks now, we have Helios, of course, their sun deity. And then to the Romans, we have Sol. And then due to the Greco Roman period, 8th century BC, all the way to the 145 BC. We know that Greek and Romans shared a really culture together when it came to their culture and their way of living. And around this time, everybody around this area spec spoke a dialect of Greek, actually, Kioan Greek. It was well written around this time and spoken too. And that is why the New Testament is actually first written in Greek, not in Hebrew, as most scholars and most people think it is. But doing your due diligence and diving into this, you'll see that it was actually written in Greek and then translated into different languages. But as we all know, Hellenization drew a big spike in the Roman Empire when it came to their culture. So as we go through this, you'll be seeing a lot of connections and similarities when it comes to other religions and cultures throughout this time. Because through conquest, all cultures took a little bits and pieces from each other and embodied a them, well, certain elements, into their cultures. When it came to the Egyptians, the Greeks, all the cultures in Mesopotamia, even to the Phoenicians, which I did a video, which you should take the time to look into it and see the roots of the Greeks. But as we all know, so as we all know, the Roman Empire wasn't established yet until later on. So around this time, the Roman Republic was going on headstrong. And to give you a little bit just of the Roman Republic was the state of the classical Roman civilization run through public representations of the Roman people 
beginning with the overthrow of the Roman kingdom, traditionally dated to 509 BC and ending in 270 BC. With establishment of the Roman Empire, the Romans' control rapidly expanded during this period, from the city's immediate surroundings to the hegemony over the Mediterranean world. And to give you a little bit more just, the Roman society under the Republic was primarily a cultural mix of Latin, Etruscan society, as well as Saban, Oscan, and of course, Greek, as we I talked upon in the beginning of this about Greek Hellenization around this period. Cultural elements, which are especially visible in Rotherham Pantheon. And if you want a little bit more background around this time, I also made a video called Roman Hellenization and the New Testament, which gives you a whole viewpoint of what's going on around this time. And I think you like this that video too, so please take a watch of that. So I won't dive too, too deep really when it comes to this time. I want to go straight into the sun worship and the deities that was around this time. So, so around this time there was a bunch of Roman soldiers being dispensed off to conquer other lands and with this they brought back different items where it comes to fragments, cloth, uh, increments statues from other cultures and brought it back to their homeland so there is also depictions of coins that were actually being traded around this time too as you'll see here we'll start off here deals with coin evidence of imperial connection to the solar cult soul is depicted sporadically on imperial coins in the first and second centuries AD then more frequently from Septimus Severus, when General Will will be going over in deep detail down the road, onwards until AD 325 through 326. And again, guys, don't get too confused with the AD and the CE. They actually mean the same thing. CE, current um, era, and AD after death. Uh, AD was established through the Catholic Church. But yeah. So it says here, Sol Invictus appears on coin legions from AD 261, well before the reign of Arleon, another general that will be uh, going over through this. But look at these coins, guys. Look, depicting everything here. I mean, there's coins going into the reign of Constantine the first, but with the Emperor Lucianus on the head. In the middle one, you see the coin of Probus. CE 280 with Sol Invictus riding a quadriga with the legion Sol Invicta with the four horses on his chariot, which we'll be dissecting a little bit more. And on the far, we have Arlian, which we'll be talking about also, and his high reading crown on the silver bronze coin struck at Rome, 274 through 275 CE. So as you can see, Sol Invictus and the worship of it was reigning now. His name is Mark Anthony.
America's fun. So it So now, when it comes to the early establishment of Sol Invictus in Rome, we have to go back a little bit and see where Sol Invictus derived from. Of course I did bring up about Mithra and its connections about how everybody and the conquerors took things from other nations and in, induced it into their own culture, whether it be to their fine arts, their ideology, and even their spiritual beliefs, as I'll show you here. The Roman conquest had exposed the legionnaires, the army, to the manners and customs, ideas, and religious convictions of the people they had successfully attacked or countries in which they had been quartered like i said after they take over an area they get uh some of their customs and ideas start to get averted into them increasing commerce with the east had intensified traffic and the merchants who bought or sold at distant markets brought back to rome not only eastern products but also strange religious ideas and dogmas as we'll see here Many of the legionnaires had encountered the principal cult of Syria, that of Sol Invictus Agabel, one of the first times that they were introduced there by the soldiers, the legionnaires, whose most important religious center was Emesa. Because the greatest concentration of troops in the east occurred in Syria, and the governor, Legatus Augustus Broditer, Augustus Augustus is pretty much of a title of the Roman leader that is actually in that area. Not only had administrative and military authority over Syria, but was also a military commander of the East. And one early event that contributed to all of this was in 64 BC when it came to Pompeii in the Third Mithridic War, where Syria was placed as a providence annexed to the Roman Republic and was used as a base hub for operations. And during this conquest and early relationship with Roman Syria, many people migrated to Rome for a better life, whether it be to Get, uh, get integrated to the Roman Empire as a soldier, which Rome was in low abundance of people to actually be a part of their rankings when it came to their military campaigns. So most of it was actually due to volunteers to be introduced into the ranks, as I'll show you here another insert from the book. In the second century, many Syrian immigrants served as domestics in Rome and other parts of Italy. Syrian merchants settled in Rome and other cities of the empire and continued to maintain their faith and religious rights wherever they were in whatever milieu they found themselves. Like I said, many immigrants came during this way into Rome looking for better to find a better life and with that, they brought down they brought with them their religious faith and their rights with them integrating it to the roman culture everywhere they organized their national cults as votaries of sol invictus egobel as i said before coming from emesa in syria jupiter dolcinus or jupiter hellasponus uh, elements from Rome as you know they also wish they are polytheistic so they honored many gods and one of them was Jupiter in places where the original worshippers of Mithras another sun cult 
that was emerged into Soul Invictus were usually Asiedia of lower station. Workmen, slaves, or Colino who had brought from their homeland to the Roman province remained true to their national cults, especially the many who stayed in Dacia and gave rise to the relatively numerous descriptions found there as dedications to Soul Invictus. And another point I want to show out right here. In addition, many Syrian soldiers enlisted in the Roman army. These soldiers who served for long periods of in a strange country did not forget their national deity so now we know that Syria and Rome had an early connection in 64 BC with Pompeii and that many Syrian refugees actually were enlisted into the Roman army and brought with them kept their religious rites and other faith and ceremonies that came with them, including Sol Invictus, as you just seen. <laughs>